subtitle, Wading Through the Web of Empire. Okay? So this idea of uh, navigating you know, through this sticky <laughs> mud of uh, imperial power. And that is basically uh, what I will be talking to you about. Um, Philippe uh, asked me to explain to you how, how I come to be here. Well, I come to be here because I've been here for, <laughs> for almost 40 years. <laughs> um, but you will see how I came to this discussion. And that is really what I meant to, uh, to discuss with you. Some of you have heard many of these things. I'll excuse myself to you for having heard them. But I tried to give them a different outlook today. Let us see what uh, you will give me your opinion later. Now, I, it's important to start by saying that uh, I descend from an old Protestant family of Northern Portugal. And that kind of background of, uh, uh, of a Protestant family um, is, is, is really what launched uh, this, this whole process that I'm about to describe to you. In the mid-1960s, the Anglican Church of Southern Africa was undergoing a process of localization, um, turning away from the missionary model. In those days, they didn't call it decolonization, but that was what they were doing. As Bishop Salvi Taylor and Bishops Alpheus Zulu and Desmond Tutu um, felt at the time that the large Anglican community in Mozambique, a Portuguese-speaking country, needed to turn away from English-speaking missionaries and build their own local clergy, capable of turning the church into a fully local endeavor. Um, they wanted to, to turn the church from a mission into a local diocese, as they had done in South Africa, uh, as they were doing in South Africa, and Desmond Tutu and Alpheus Zulu, who was the Bishop of Natal, are really the, 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 the figures that led that kind of anti-apartheid, anti-decolonization movement that was part of South African history from the early 60s, uh, it, uh, it started. For that, they needed an intermediary whose task would be that of raising the educational level of the Mozambican priesthood and preparing a future local bishop. In 1967, my father, who had studied to be an Anglican priest in the United Kingdom in the late 1940s, was chosen to carry out that task. In that year, therefore, we moved to Mozambique, and as a result, I spent my adolescent days in that country. Like most of my fellow students at the time, I was touched by the spirit of renewal that marked our generation uh, throughout the world after 1968. As a result, I came to identify deeply with the country and its people. A country that was yet to be un país que ainda não é. In the words of a Mozambican exiled poet, Virginia, the language that I've been reading and that really deserves me reading. We candidly supported the call for independence that in the northern borders of the territory was opposing the liberation movements to the decadent fascist and colonial dictatorship that had ruled Portugal with an iron fist since 1930. My decision to study social anthropology in neighboring Johannesburg had a lot to do with my perceived need to get to know better the history and population of Mozambique. At the University of Vatosram, I was blessed with the influence of a group of professors and colleagues, among whom I have to bring out these names. There were many that influenced me, but these were really foundational. Um, David Hammond Took, David Webster, Pancho Gerdich, Johnny Clay, and William Kentridge, the, late, la, the last two actually colleagues of mine, the, earliest, uh, the earlier ones professors, who remain inspirations to this day. In 1977, however, as I was finishing a master's degree in Johannesburg, the newly independent Mozambique was going through a troubled period of socialist extremism. And I knew it would not be safe for me to return, 
most likely, I would be sent to a re-education camp, like many of my acquaintances had been. I've just been speaking to Philippe of a film ma made by the person who was the director of the first re-education camp in Mozambique, and uh, which need, really needs to be seen. It's, it's, it's a marvelous discussion about history and about the way we are all immersed in that history and we do things that later we don't want to have done, but that is part of, of, of being there. Then followed 16 years of a very brutal civil war. And it was only after 1992, when the ruling party dropped the, the socialist veneer in a matter of months and turned the country into a neoliberal's paradise, that I managed to return. In July 1997, after an absence of about 20 years, what I found in the capital, now renamed Maputo, caused in me a mixture of fascination and surprise. As I moved around, I quickly came to see that my very presence produced an uncanny effect on the people who received me. Just by being there, I seemed to cause doubts. In short, I discovered that my becoming present to him worked as a catalyst of history. My presence unveiled the insights the inhabitants of the capital found hard to confront. At first, they responded to my whiteness and my Portuguese accent with a mixture of suspicion and distaste. But then they quickly realized that we were on the same wavelength, and they easily found spaces for me in their daily lives. I was just speaking to Sophia, and she was reflecting how that happened to her as well. Suddenly we find people saying, we versus them, and we do not know where you are placed. <laughs> they say, we do this, they do it. And suddenly there is kind of ambiguity. Are you in the we category, or are you in the them category? Uh, it sort of becomes ambiguous. Our sharing of a common Portuguese language and all the cultural scaffolding that goes with it clearly contributed to this sense of proximity, but it was not all. My having a deep familiarity with the country, even if a little outdated 20 years later, also heightened the effect. Nevertheless, for me too, going back involved a kind of emotional engagement that outwardly might be interpreted as a personal nostalgia. In fact, however, it was much more than just that. I was being obliged to rethink not only what I knew about Mozambique and its people, but also to rethink myself. As the world I was re-encountering remained deeply buried in my own ontogenetic history as a person. <coughs> in the same way that my Mozambican friends and acquaintances first estranged me and then embraced me, I too found that I was responding to the statements and to the world that they assumed in their daily lives first with surprise, and then with a kind of passive understanding that echoed back my early education as an Africanist anthropologist. And this is very important. Uh, having been trained as an Africanist anthropologist, I had a kind of a background knowledge of Southern African societies that kind of uh, helped fit the bits of information that I was using. One of the things that struck me most was the way in which Mozambican everyday exchanges were habitually infused with fantastic and slightly unnerving stories. These were patently loaded with meanings that were seldom made explicit. Furthermore, the truth status of these bits of information that continuously circulated in the daily encounters of the streets of Maputo always remained vaguely uncertain. In fact, it seemed to me that they were supposed to foster a kind of ambivalent and equivocal aspect of their everyday world. They kind of equivocated the world. The receiver, whilst knowing fully well that the proponent of these more fantastic statements did not hold much truth value to what he was suggesting, <coughs> still could not refrain from being affected by the world-shaping power of the symbolic associations that the statements themselves set up. There seem to be layers and layers of implications that might be peeled off from each of these straight-faced accounts. No one seemed to care to do that, however. Usually, it was all met with a kind of derision, sort of a smile, and that often seemed to border on concern and suspicion. 
Um, I'll give you an example. For example, one day a colleague of mine, uh, uh, to whom I had a uh, there too, to whom I had talked about this, came to pick me up from the university after classes because I was giving classes at Mount Lyon University. As I entered the car, she was smiling and she said, "You cannot believe what just what I just heard on the radio as well." They reported that in ten. A pregnant woman went to the hospital. She was safely delivered of the baby and of an unripe mango. After a few days, she went back home, taking the baby and the mango with her. To claim that the implication of this piece of news was that there had been witches at work turns out to be almost ethnocentric. Since what was at stake in a straight-faced statement such as this one was far more than just that. The statement itself merely alerted the listener to the possibility of a whole deep layer of equivocations, of which witchcraft kinds of causation, of course, would be a central aspect. However, political domination and the implications of irrationality it evokes in normal Mozambican citizens today turned out to be no less implicit in the whole soup of meanings that were elicited by this piece of news on the radio. Just a piece of design. These statements provided a kind of alternative layer to everyday exchanges that seemed to open them to the sense of irrationality that so strongly concerned Mozambicans at the turn of the 20th century, after the traumas they went through in their recent post colonial and pre colonial history. Yet for me, they also echoed the old anthropological debates concerning what it is to believe. I'm referring here, for example, to my supervisor, Rodney Needham's famous, famously quizzical book, Belief, Language and Experience of 1972, which in many ways worked out for an anthropological theory, much like the baby and mango story for the inhabitants of death. That's the same sort of purpose. When anthropologists, sociologists, or geographers blindly declare in a straight-faced manner the Afghans, or the Tories in England, or the Jews believe this or that, what precisely does belief stand for? Returning to Mozambique after so many years, I could not escape the sense that these stories, accounts, implications, performances, these beliefs opened up the everyday world to layers of evident invisible. That is what E. E. Cummings, the American poet, calls those aspects of the world that remain invisible, not only in the sense that you grasp them by implication, without seeing or hearing them, but rather in the sense that they are what does not come readily labeled. And the meaning of which is produced jointly, cybernetically, in everyday interactions. Evident invisibles are shared, but their meaning is only to be achieved in the course of the participatory sense-making that company with other persons permits. This invisible evidence constitutes a relational climate. I'm going to refer to the study of prisons, which they say that different prisons have different climates prisonais. I'm talking about that. I like that sense of a kind of an overall general climate to a social condition which allows one to enter into the tone of the world of the people one encounters in everyday exchanges. They are not secrets because they are in fact shared and in that way they are evident to everyone. But they point out what Derrida calls a secret of a secret. Something that works its effects in one's world but which no longer is fully traceable. The book I have recently published called Transcolonial gathers a series of essays that I wrote after 19, the 1997 uh, experience that I'm about to recount to you. As I never pretended to turn Mozambique into one of my ethnographic fieldwork sites, I published them over the years moved by a kind of inevitability, a compulsion to make sense to myself rather than to others of what I experienced then in Maputo and in Yaban and later on in 2000 and 2001, when I went back to Mozambique to teach at Mongolian University. Two decades again after that, 
I felt that this long series of papers actually congealed around the theme of transcoloniality. That is, the condition of one who moves across empires and their corresponding hegemonies, negotiating a world that is permanently marked by powers that both make one and unmake one as a person. In other words, I argue that in one's contemporary world, one inevitably navigates through a thick web of imperiality that is both past-oriented and future-oriented. Transcoloniality is not only temporal in the sense that I lived in Mozambique both before and after the end of Portuguese colonial rule. It is also spatial in the sense that from the first encounter with anthropology in Johannesburg, I realized that my very Portugueseness was itself a kind of stigma. And that the Portuguese coloniality that I had rebelled against in Mozambique was itself enfolded within other, more powerful forms of Anglo-American imperialist hegemony. Mm -hmm. At the same time as I carried out my ethnographic fieldwork among Eurasians in southern China, I did that throughout the first part of the 1990s, I was deeply struck by a feeling that I was navigating the borders of different cultural scaffoldings. These contemporary but contrasting hegemonies that my Eurasian mestizo acquaintances have to navigate across in southern Chinese cities operated both as margins of political power and as margins of personal presence. The same, the very same person who handed you of, of, uh, uh, a card, a visiting card, mm -hmm. huh? had on one side the Portuguese name, on the other a Chinese name, but they were not translations in China. Okay? So that sense that the, the card itself divided the, the very person because they inserted into society where the hegemonies, where, where the relations of power. The book I published in 2002 on the origins of Macau and Hong Kong was subtitled Person, Culture and Emotion, precisely to suggest that kind of constitutive personal entanglement. In what follows, I will recount how I came across these concerns in Mozambique and how that contributed towards a growing preoccupation with the matter of how each one of us moves throughout the world, meeting with a series of affordances of symbolic power not only across time, but also across space. I call that our transcolonial condition, much in the same way as Derrida generalizes to all of us his own deeply felt Mahan metaphysics. You all know what the Mahan is, uh, mm -hmm. okay? In 1997, I did not know if I would ever again be able to return to Mozambique, so I felt that I needed to visit the Bay of Inyambana the region to which me and my siblings remained most deeply attached, where my father had built for us a small holiday cabin by the, by the sea. Having learned that I had rented a car, an old Mozambican friend of mine offered to accompany me. The war had finished only a few years before. The main road to the north from the capital was still vaguely unsafe, both in terms of the results of earlier landmines and in terms of possible lawless elements. On the way north, which is 500 kilometers, every so often we came across groups of people singing and praying, celebrating their dead by the roadside. This was very surprising. A good number of them. Every, every so many kilometers we, we saw in this series. My friend was concerned that a white person alone might find it difficult to navigate the patent irrationalities of that post-traumatic landscape. Like me, he was also born into a family of Anglican priests. And we had been friends at the time I was studying in university when I returned to our family's home in Inyamba for holidays. He was a, a, secondary, uh, a secondary school teacher in those days. And I, I asked him to give some classes for him. Uh, and I, I did that. So we, we, had, we had shared We had shared on our way north, we were accompanied by a Muslim carpenter who had a business connection with my friend. It all started when we passed the fork in the road to Bilene, near Ricatla, where the Swiss missionary ethnographer, Marie Alessandro Junot, had lived in the last decade of the 19th century. 
I decided to tell them what the people of Bilem thought of the Portuguese in those already distant days. I had come across this story a few months earlier while looking for a reference in the famous monograph that Juno published on the peoples he called Tonga or Tonga. He used both words. The final version of his monumental work, The Life of a South African Tribe, was published in English in successive editions from 1912 onwards and has become a central reference for all sociocultural and anthropologists and sociologists since then, especially those writing about Southern Africa. Suffice it to say that the theoretical essays that launched structural functionalism in the Anglo-American world in the 1920s and 30s were written by Red Brown using Juno's ethnography as its main source of material. To cut a long story short, in the 1890s, the population of this region were for the first time confronted with a permanent Portuguese colonial presence. In contrast to the small trading posts that had characterized the European presence in the region until then, the local population now had to negotiate control of their land and their ways of life with Portuguese administrators. And that's the image that I wanted to show you, uh, and that is there in the, in the screen uh, that, that is taken from Eric Galvan's book on Atlikofishi that I will speak about um, and, and it shows the three the three characters uh, that are important which is the administrator having our money right or receiving it God knows the Sipayo translator uh, uh, mediator in the middle making sure that he's coming in the middle and then you have the local man who, who is in a kind of servile condition uh, negotiating with the white man, okay? But this is something that never happened in Mozambique until 1890. It's from 1890 onwards that this kind of relationship started. Albeit few in numbers, these colonial officers wielded considerable power as they were supported by indigenous troops, the famous Sipai regiments, mostly manned by what were called then, and now it's supposed to be a word of offense, Landinj, that is, members of the Nguni military aristocracy that had conquered the south of the country before the Portuguese established their power, and whose descendants are today the central component of Freyrimo, the party in power since independence. Uh, Shisana, for example, but it's just an example. Shisana is the great grandson of uh, uh, of a general of, uh, 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 of uh, the original Nguni uh, conqueror. Okay. These very Sipayo troops were from These very Sipayo troops were used by the Portuguese throughout their possessions in the South Asian seas. In Macau alone, there were three popular uprisings by the Chinese population against them in the first half of the 20th century. Okay? Just in Macau. In Timor, there were trouble as well. There were trouble as well, and in Goa, they were not very much like Junot was not keen on the Portuguese, whose Catholicism he deeply despised. He recounts with evident pleasure the following conversation he had with one of his assistants, whom he called Piccinini and who often appears in his ethnographic accounts as a trusted informant. It's somebody that worked for, for Juno clearly for more than a decade. Because yeah, you, you, you find me you find in different accounts. So the conversation is between Juno and Piccinini. He transcribes, says, Piccinini once told me what the Bilan people think of the whites. It was just after the deportation of Gungulé, the, military, uh, the former military ruler of Gaza. Says Piccinini, Gumbunyan is dead. The Portuguese have eaten him. Says Juno. Who is that? How is that? Piccinini. Certainly, the Portuguese eat human flesh. Everyone knows it. They have no legs. They are fishes. Ting <coughs> hunting. They have a tail instead of legs. They live in water. Juno. Then how do they manage to fight with you and to beat you if they are fishes and have no legs? Beginning, oh, those who come to fight against us, 
are the young men. They are men. They take us and put us all in a steamer which goes far, far away. The steamer reaches a large rock which is surrounded by water on all sides. This is their country. We are taken out and placed on an island whilst the soldiers go and fire shots to announce to the great white men fishes that we have arrived. <coughs> they choose one of us and make a little cut in his little finger to see if he's fat enough. If not, he is put into a big basket full of groundnuts, which he must eat in order to become fat. When he is fat enough, they place him in a big elongated pot of the size of a man, which is red hot. We know these particulars because a man, Ngomongomo, gave us the full explanation. He had been caught, but on the road, his gods helped him. He was covered with an eruption of pimples, which was so disgusting that he was left in the island and brought back here. He saw everything. We first refused to believe that. Now we know that it is true. And Juno continues. Evidently, Piccinini was in earnest, and his absurd ideas were accepted as facts by the majority of his countrymen in Belém. Is it not strange to notice that whilst a great number of Europeans think of the blacks as being all cannibals, these savages, on the other hand, believe exactly the same thing of us? In former times, the Tongas would seem to have believed that all white people, not only the Portuguese, dwelt in the water. They were said to have eyes in front and behind, and to see on all sides, so that it was impossible to escape from them. They used to kidnap black people and take them away. End of quote. I now return to that day of traveling between Montuto and Nina. Remembering Piccanini's account about the which I've just quoted, I said to my companions, Ah, can you believe? And I summarized to them the story above. A century ago, there was a man here who thought the Portuguese were fish, etc. Et Frankly, in light of what happened next, I can't. <laughs> 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 clearly not a fish, okay? <laughs> However, the reaction was nothing of the sort. My friend sitting next to me in the carpet in the back seat allowed a long silence to settle over what had been, up to that point, a pleasant and lively conversation. A while afterwards, however, the carpenter, laughing shyly, said, ah, it's like salted cod. Bacalhau. I cannot forget this sentence, so great was my surprise. Then they explained that among the local people, mothers tell children a strange story about salted cod. When both of them were infants, they believed it to be true, which is particularly interesting in the case of my friend, who comes from a literate Christian family of considerable local prestige. So it was pretty spread throughout. As you know, bacalhau is, so to speak, the totemic food of the Portuguese. That is, what defines being Portuguese is eating bacalhau. And in colonial Mozambique, this was the case. The Tsonga mothers used to ask their children, have you asked yourself why cod has no head? Because the Portuguese cut it off, of course. But why did they cut it off? 
because cod are women that approach these fish out of the high sea. There was a sexual connotation in the story. Mm -hmm. The Portuguese sleep with them, then they cut off their tails and throw them back into the sea, and the tail grows back again. It is these tails that are eaten. Junot collected the story from Piccinini's mouth in the last years of the 19th century. But my friend's mothers had told them the story in the late 1950s. Contrary to Junot's stated opinion, the greater familiarity with the Portuguese was not going to change Tsonga beliefs. If belief, as used by Junot, really is the correct word here, and that's the whole point of the book. Furthermore, it was not I who made the association between the two stories. They did. They were the ones who, who said, it's like Rokhaya. Knowing that one of the classic fears of any ethnographer is to make rash metaphorical associations, here we had an almost unique situation. It was the holders of the story themselves who justified the veracity of the anthropological exegesis by claiming that the cannibal myth of Bilan stated the same thing as the court story their mothers had told them half a century later. It was them, not me, who owned, so to speak, this bit of levi strauss myth analysis. In the case of the cod, the anthropophagy of these ambiguous humans functions as a kind of metaphor for colonial appropriation. In the association of the two stories, an identification is set up between the colonialist and the marine environment of the high seas. In addition, there is an association concerning the difference between the sexes. The later account is about Portuguese men who, in the high seas, have sex with women who are fish, stealing part of their bodies. The story declares that it is this appropriation of the vital force by sex that gives rise to the totemic food of the Portuguese. But in the combination of the two relatives, we perceive yet another relationship. In the story of Piccinini, the Portuguese are fish. But in the story of the cod, the mermaid is the fish. But the one who eats is always the Portuguese. Thus the second is to the native in the Milan story as the man is to the woman in the cod story. I warned you about that story, okay? Colonial subalternity is reinterpreted in the light of the gender subalternity so characteristic of Mozambique. What my Mozambican friends taught me that day was that I myself am part of these anthropophagic pathways. I too am a bit of a cannibal fish. As a result, my very presence had a strange effect on the people I met in Mozambique. It unleashed a transcolonial experience that was both familiar and disturbing to those who experienced it. There was, in the exchange, an imminent pastness as Edmini Martins, a Portuguese Mozambican sociologist, used to call it. Let us recall the words of Osvaldo de Andrade, the famous Brazilian botanist, who in his classic 1928 work, Manifesto Anthropophagy, states that anthropophagy is the permanent transformation of the taboo into a totem. For me, this is a very profound truth. Namely, that the breaking of a taboo can then become a phenomenon of such force that new identities are founded upon it. Thus, in the spirit reminiscence of levi strauss arguments concerning the role of the maternal uncle, it is not the group that produces the term two, taboo, but the taboo that produces the group. The colonial acts of violence, immediately followed by 16 years of post-independence civil war, do not simply disappear. They have become a basis for the constitution of new identities. This is the case in Mozambique, but also elsewhere, where the Portuguese have passed. And by the way, there's a kind of a funny twist to this, you'll excuse me. But of course, Levi Strauss's discussion is based on journalism too. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that, that too is, is particularly weird. That it, it all sits inside of Mozambique somehow. Mm -hmm. Of course, therefore, also here in Lisbon, among all of those who, like me, are the bearers of the imminence of history, the same thing happens. In short, the continuity of history leads without escape to the constitution of mediators. This is what Osvaldo de Andrade means when he says of Brazilians, only anthropophagy 
unites us. And that, in a way, is what this photograph shows about Mozambique today. Okay? If this is the case, it is a singularly powerful form of vengeance on violence. The following chapter in the book responds to these concerns and was drafted in Mozambique during the period in 2000 when I was teaching there. In 1997, on coming back home, I had gone up to Oporto to visit my aging parents. I told them of the story of the Portuguese being cannibals. My mother, who had been brought up in the 1930s in Angola, where my grandfather had been a naval officer, took me to their library and took out a book on African cannibalism, saying, I issued this. The book was written by a Portuguese Africanist fiction and travel writer, Eric Galvão, who had turned against the dictatorship in the mid-1950s, shortly after writing this book called Anthropophage. My parents were very keen on this man, as he had been one of the most vocal early opponents of, dictator, of the dictator. Nevertheless, as I read the book, my surprise and my sense of displacement increased to the point of genuine puzzlement. Here was an educated and politically very well-informed military officer who corroborated all sorts of horrendous lies concerning the heinous pantagruelism. Um, pantagruelism with the old war. The man had a nick for, for turn of phrase, okay? That supposedly led those, he either called them, called them all the same thing, he either called them Bantu or Zulus and Basutu, he never knew what he was talking about, uh, to practice cannibalism. Modern Portuguese officers and administrators of the 1940s, and he gives us photographic evidence of it. It's, it's absolutely shocking. Like him, interpreted literally the African idiom of eating, used to refer to witchcraft accusations. Like Derrida's secret of a secret, this was an equivoke of an equivoke. As a result, it all turned to an even more tragic end. The Portuguese administrators judged the people whose relatives accused them of witchcraft as homicides, and then proceeded to send them to Santo Bay Island as forced labor to work under horribly inhumane conditions on the cocoa plantations. They might well have believed the stories upon which they accused these poor rural folk, but they did not fail to gain from trafficking their, these people as enslaved labor on the excuse that they would thus be turned away from their activistic recidivism, another marvelous phrase from Eric uh, Galvão, uh, that led them to crave for human meat. In Maputo, when I found myself back there in 2000 and 2001, the tragic symmetry of these two accounts struck me and the height of my attention to the vagaries of belief. Indeed, the central chapter in the book concerns beliefs in, in albinos. A, tra a deeply tragic situation that was then causing innumerable deaths throughout Southeast Asia, Africa. It all started from the account I received by everyone around me, in Maputo and in Yaban, they all agreed about it, albinos do not die. I tried to interpret this statement, or belief, if you wish to call it that, in light of mythical accounts from elsewhere. However, it soon became evident that what was being stated was not that albinos were immortal, rather they were supposed not to be received by Africa's earth. It rejected them. The so to speak folklore that I gathered from conversations with my friends about albinos connected directly with the whole mythology concerning racial difference that I had explored in the chapters in Canada. I soon came to realize that albinos were being tortured, maimed, killed, and ill-treated throughout the countries of Southeast Africa. Malawi is one of the worst, but Mozambique is no better. Um, because they breached the major post-colonial cosmological divide between whiteness and blackness. They threatened the blackness of our land. This led me to revisit the philosophical literature on belief. And in particular, I depended on Kwan's discussion of the way in which belief structure is conservative. As Davidson puts it, Davidson is a disciple of, uh, of Kwan. Disciple, someone that follows up Kwan. 
there is a presumption in favor of the truth of a belief that coheres with a significant mass of belief. Believing is not only affected by ostensivity, that is, that which you experience directly in common with another interlocutor. For example, we're all experiencing <coughs> heat. And I know you're experiencing it, you know, so heat is ostensive to us at this moment. Okay? It is, it is also about retentivity, that is, your proneness to structure your garden of belief before others, as Quan used to put it. He claims observation is the tug that tows the ship of theory, but in extreme cases, the theory pulls so hard that observation yields. Over the decades, I have come to realize that this kind of bittersweet familiarity, this transcolonial ontological anxiety, did not apply only to the lands that were formerly colonized by the Portuguese state. It could be observed, of course, in Macau, toward Brazil, but also among Portuguese migrants in Paris, Johannesburg, New York, uh, mm -hmm. San Jose, California. Mm -hmm. Circulation within the universe created by the Portuguese expansion, both the colonial one and the migratory one, has never been an, as intense as it is today. This space-time of lusotopic circulation, <coughs> where people recognize themselves and at the same time are frightened by this very recognition, is a space of mixing of complexity of cross-breed. As the surprising events <coughs> that I met in Mozambique unfolded, so did the accounts I wrote of them in order to try to make sense both of what I saw and of what I became as a result. Let me tell you here one last case in order to make this point more clearly. One afternoon, I was walking <coughs> with a colleague, um, Paul Gretchen, um, in a neighborhood of Maputo's so-called cement city. We passed by a man who was visibly very drunk. As he wobbled down the road with his shirt in his hand, supported by a friend, okay, I felt the man's hand suddenly grip in my arm. But as I looked in his eyes, I saw he was benevolent, and I responded with a smile. He asked, what card do you belong to? In Portuguese we say, de que clube és tu? This is this kind of ontological statement. Literally, of which club are you? I replied, ah, I am of Porto. He raised his arms in the air and said, you lost Jardel to us, so now you can know what it is to be poor. My colleague, o Paulo Granjo, who happens to be from Sporting, like the man, explained to me that this was a very successful Brazilian player who had just moved from Porto to Sporting. As his friend pulled him into the bus, and then leaning out of the bus window, with this kind of naked torso, the man kept shouting, and now you can know what it is to be poor. I got a bunch of miracles of poor. Everyone around the bus stop was laughing. The bus moved away as we waved goodbye to each other. Because we, we were we were of different clubs, we were both similar and different. So now I, who visibly was not destitute, could know what he felt like in his daily destitution. Mm -hmm. I need hardly any gravel further than the lyrical entanglement of this artistic performance that he set up. So evident they are. In my working with the Eurasians in Macau, if my working with the Eurasians in Macau had not been enough, these experiences in Mozambique called my attention to something that followed me my life through wherever I went the conviction that there is no purity of identity in a world like ours, where transcoloniality is an all-embracing condition. As a male Portuguese person and as a white man in Africa and Asia, I can feel the way I am both empowered and stigmatized by the very history which is imminent in me. In fact, merely by being present, I work as a catalyst of a certain kind of history. You know, like in a chemical uh, 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 solution. In my case, the history of the Portuguese expansion and all that followed upon it. I create lusotopy wherever I go, unwillingly. 
unbeknownst to me. Those who meet me and come to be affected by my presence, even if passingly, as the Spartan fan in a Maputo bus, are contaminated by me and by the long history of the entanglements produced across the world by this history. They land up becoming part of what I call Lusotropy, the space of ecumenical familiarity created by history. Unlike many of our colleagues, and here I'm thinking in particular of Christian Jacques uh, he has a particular essay that, that has to be read, even though I, I bet you won't agree with it, because I don't, who wrote so brilliantly on Mozambique, but also as brought into the social scientist. I do not despise those who, as a result of history, are no longer able to convince others of the purity of their identity. Mestizage is everyone's condition. In order to despise or reject it, I would have had to despise myself. There is no cure for cannibalism. Anthropophagy is all that unites us, as the Brazilian modernist said. In this sense, then, Lusotopy is not exclusively a post <coughs> response, as moving to the social status would have it. Quite the opposite. We who circulate in this formless space-time resulting from Portuguese and European imperial expansions are subject to the imminence of a particular past, which, although it remains always vague and formless, is nonetheless very present. I, I was telling them that recently I met a group of three Mozambican youngsters, about 30 intellectuals. They, they, they're kind of doing their Portuguese trip, all right? <laughs> it's part of uh, uh, their life history. Uh, and I said, are you enjoying Lisbon? They said, they enjoy Lisbon very much. And I said to them, so Lisbon is one of the nicest bairros of Maputo, isn't it? And they said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so you can see what I mean. There's this, this sense of, 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 of continuity. Ours is a Marrano metaphysics, like David I. He, that he was an, an Algerian Jew. He does not know. Uh, he was Sephardic. He does not know if his ancestors were Marrano's crypto Jews mm -hmm. or if they were not. He does not know because, as he puts it, I cannot know the secret of the secret. And the secret is in part. He knows he's Jewish, but he does not know how he came to be Jewish in Algeria. And so he's dealing with this metaphysics of re-encountering the possibility of his in fact being a Mahan. And, uh, 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 and he does not know. Like the Hida, we may not propose a metaphor.